Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our Bible study today. We thank you for your revelation of your word. We thank you for the truth and the light that you bring our way. Thank you because at such a time like this, we are established in your word. We are praying, O oh Lord, that you will so help us to understand your word, so that we will live according to your word at such a time like this in Jesus' name. We pray that today you will open our spiritual understanding so we can understand the deep truth revealed in your word for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Our study today brings us to chapter 17 of the book of Exodus. This chapter has a lot to teach us as God's covenant people. And this chapter is connected with the previous chapter. The connection between the two chapters will discover the beginning of chapter 17. It says, and all the congregation of the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin. The miracle of divine provision has just been performed for the children of Israel. And then the following chapter opens with a need in their lives. While the manna and the testimony were still in their mouth, a new problem arose. That's the lesson in our lives. Sometimes God has just answered a prayer. Sometimes we have just given a testimony. Sometimes manna has just been provided for us, and then there is a new need in our lives. For the children of Israel, a new test of faith came to find out if they had learned their lesson, if they had grown in faith. God's promises and provision for us in times of need shall make our faith to grow and shall prepare us to behave with maturity when new problems arise. Let us learn to lean upon the Lord at all times, knowing that he who provided in the past can solve all present problems and meet all future needs. Look at this verse 1 fully. And all the congregation of the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin after their journeys according to the commandment of the Lord and pitched in Rephidim and there was no water for the people to drink. Let us note that in this verse 1 we are told that they journeyed according to the commandment of the Lord. And yet the Bible says at the same time in that verse, there was no water for the people to drink. The Lord knew there was no water there, and yet he directed them to this very place because he knew what he could do to provide water. Now, here we need to make a correction in our lives. Sometimes when we get to the place where there is no water, we make the conclusion that the journey is not according to the will of God. Once there is a problem in our plan of the marriage, we say, well, maybe what I thought was the will of God is no more the will of God. Once we meet with difficulty in the work of God, oh, we say the difficulty shows maybe it is not the will of God for me to work for him. Sometimes when we've not got child in the family, then we say maybe the marriage was not the will of God. Or it maybe we're doing a kind of work and there is no water, there is no promotion, there is no money. Immediately, our human mind will conclude maybe it is not the will of God. We must be very careful whenever there is no water. That is, Whenever present needs arise in our lives, not to immediately think that we are out of God's will. Then the uh, people began to lay blame. But you see, instead of blaming our leaders in the church, or blaming our friend, or even blaming the devil, whenever there is a problem, the first thing to realize is that in every circumstance where our faith is tested, then we know that the Lord himself has brought us there. If that be the prevailing thought in our hearts, then it will not be difficult for us to trust the Lord so that he will sustain us while we are there. This chapter contains two important lessons and two important things. One, there is the water out of the smitten rock. Two, there is a victory over the Amalekites that waged war against the children of Israel. So the title of our story today is The Smitten Rock and the Conquered Foe the smitten rock, and the conquered foe. We're looking at the chapter in three divisions or three subtitles. Number one, carnality manifested in times of desperate need. Number two, water from the rock. Number three, Israel's victory over the Amalekites. We go to the first part, which is carnality manifested in times of desperate need. Exodus chapter 17, verses 1 to 3. And all the congregation of the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin 
after their journeys according to the commandment of the Lord and pitched in Rephidim, and there was no water for the people to drink. In verse 2, wherefore the people did chide with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said unto them, Why chide ye with me? Why, wherefore do ye tempt the Lord? And the people tested there for water, and the people murmured against Moses and said, Wherefore is this, that thou hast brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst? Now we see the trial of faith that came to the children of Israel in the form of a legitimate need. I told you already that it was God himself that led them in this way that they came. And as they were walking, journeying, according to the will of God, a legitimate need arose in their lives. The legitimate need was that they needed water to drink. There are some things that are legitimate in our lives. It is legitimate to want to get married. It is legitimate to want to have children. It is legitimate for us to be able to have accommodation. And it is legitimate to have enough food to eat, to have water to drink. But you know the absence of the fulfillment of this legitimate need can become a test of faith in our lives. You see, the children of Israel were walking by sight and not by faith. They were looking up to Moses to provide water for them in the wilderness. They were not looking up to God. They thought, after all, that he knew or he ought to know where to find water because of his acquaintance with this region. Although they had seen enough manifestations of God's power, they did not look up to the rock that begat them. They failed the test of faith by murmuring instead of praying. Let's look at our lives. When we do not have water to drink, I mean money to spend, I mean a woman or a man to marry, I mean food to eat, I mean the job we ought to do. When there is a legitimate need in our lives, do we rejoice at all times? Do we make our needs known unto God with thanksgiving? Do we pray with faith? Do we rely upon the Lord? Do we have any positive confession that he who has done all this for me in the past, he will do this as well for me? Or do we begin to grumble and begin to criticize and find fault with everything around us? Our attitudes and actions in the times of need, in the times when there are personal problems and family problems, those attitudes reveal our true spiritual state. And so you see the children of Israel, they grumbled and they murmured. Unfortunately, this was what they always did whenever a problem arose in their lives. At a later time in Numbers chapter 20, reading from verse 2. Look at it very carefully, Numbers chapter 20, verse 2. And there was no water for the congregation, and they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron. And the people chose with Moses and spake, saying, Would God that we had died when our brethren died before the Lord. And why have ye brought us up, uh, brought the congregation up into this wilderness, that we and our cattle should die there? And wherefore have ye made us to come up out of Egypt to bring us into this evil place? It is no place of seed and of figs, of vines, of pomegranates, neither is there any water to drink. These children of Israel, they were not matured at all. They complained, they grumbled about everything. There was no gratitude, there was no gratitude. They were not grateful at all. They never thanked God for all that he has done for them. God gave them manna to eat and they ate all that. There was no thank you. They were just grumbling, we have not got water. It's better to go back to Egypt. We should have died in Egypt. Do you see the attitude of the people? There are some people who behave like that even today. You have a lot of carnality in their hearts. They grumble, they murmur, they manifest immaturity and carnality whenever there is any problem. In Genesis chapter 30 verse 1. Genesis chapter 30 verse 1. And Rachel saw that she bare Jacob no children. Rachel envied her sister and said unto Jacob, Give me children or else I die. Now you can see that that is the same attitude of uh, depending upon a man not looking up to God. Looking up to the husband, give me children, else I will die. There are some women that do that today. 
they will murmur, they will grumble, they will fight, they will do everything against the husband. They say, give me children. They think that it's the man, it's the husband that will manufacture children. They are not depending upon the Lord to give them children. You see, that attitude is the attitude of not being grateful to God, not having faith in God, not looking up to God to supply all our needs. What was the interpretation of the attitude of the children of Israel? In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 16. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 16. Ye shall not tempt the Lord your God as he tempted him in Massa. You see, when they were grumbling the way they were grumbling, they were tempting the Lord. Anytime we grumble, anytime we murmur, in our circumstances, we're not trusting the Lord, we are tempting the Lord. In Psalm 106 from verse 13, They soon forgot his works, they waited not for his counsel, but lusted exceedingly in the wilderness and tempted God in the desert. In fact, we should understand that after the recent experience at Mara, when God provided water for them in a miraculous way, they should have promptly trusted the Lord. They should have turned to God for a miraculous supply of water. But unfortunately, they, they failed the test before them. In our midst today, don't we find the same attitude? Many carnal, unsanctified Christians see the tragic repetition of Israel's failures in their own lives. In times of needs in their lives, you find murmuring or you find rash utterance. A kind of language that is not reasonable, that is not befitting a child of God. Or they begin to have negative criticism. Criticizing Moses or criticizing Aaron or criticizing the provision of God or even criticizing God. Or you find discouragement. Acting as if they cannot move forward again. Because there's no water to drink. Because I've not got married. Because see now I've not got any child. Or there is lukewarmness. Or you find prayerlessness in them. Like these children of Israel, you see, they couldn't pray, they couldn't talk to God, they could only quarrel and fight with Moses. For some of us, worry and anxiety will take over our lives. Or there will be impatience. We cannot wait for 30 minutes more, one hour more, give us water now, we must drink water now. The final result will be there will be unbelief. They will not believe that God will not take them to the promised land. After all, if we have just gone out, we have just come out and there is no water to drink, what do we know of the future? Unbelief will take over their lives. Their hearts will distrust the promises of God. Then they will be leaning upon the arm of the flesh. All those things reveal the carnality in the heart of some people. But let us see what the Lord has told us in Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3 from verse 9. When your fathers tempted me and proved me and saw my works forty years, wherefore I was grieved with that generation and said, They do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath they shall not enter into my rest. See the repetition of the murmuring, the grumbling, the complaining, the fighting, the quarreling, and trusting the arms of the flesh in their lives. The result was that they couldn't enter the land of Canaan. The result of being prayerless, the result of uh, being impatient, the result of not being grateful for anything at all, always criticizing, always finding fault, the result in their life was that they couldn't enter the land of Canaan. The result of going from tent to tent and finding fault and criticizing, do you like this, Moses? Do you see what Moses has done? Do you have water to drink now? Look at our need now. We came from the land of Egypt. Why did he bring us out? The result of going from tent to tent, from house to house, gossiping, backbiting. The result is that they couldn't get into the land of Canaan. We should be very careful in our lives. How are we going to make the rapture? How are we going to get to heaven if our lives are full of murmuring, negative criticism, lukewarmness, prayerlessness, worry and anxiety, impatience as well as leaning upon the arm of the flesh? If that is what fills our lives, how are we going to get to the promised land? That's why we are told in verse 12 of Hebrews chapter 3, Take it, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. As we talk about the attitude of the children of Israel, we ought to talk about the attitude of Moses, their leader. We should thank the Lord for a leader like Moses. 
and we are still benefiting from the ministry of his life even today. We look at now Exodus chapter 17. We're going to the second point, which is water from the rock. If Moses had done what they did, there will be no water from the rock. If Moses had not trusted the Lord and prayed unto the Lord and cried unto the Lord, how do we have this miracle we're going to read about now? It is a lesson for us. If the members of the house fellowship are immature, the leader of the house fellowship should be mature. If the members of the district church, if they are immature, the leader of that district church ought to be mature. If the members of the family are prayerless and lukewarm, the head of that home, the head of that family ought to be matured and prayerful. In response to the murmuring of the children of Israel, Moses demonstrated maturity and leadership qualities. He corrected the people and he showed them the evil of their ways. We leaders have to make sure that we correct people when they go wrong. You see that in verse 3. When he said, Wherefore is this that thou hast... When he said, They are not uh, grumbling against uh, him, but they are grumbling against God. You see that in all the other things uh, that he had said before, as well as now how he prayed unto the Lord. Then you will see how he prayed unto the Lord. We are told that he cried unto the Lord. From verse 4. And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, What shall I do unto this people? They be almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go on before the people, and take with thee of the elders of Israel, and thy rod, wherewith thou smotest the river. Take in thine hand, and go. And then we are told in verse 6, Behold, I will stand before thee there, upon the rock in Oreb, and thou shalt smite the rock. And there shall come water out of it, and the people that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. The fact that Moses prayed should teach us a lesson. You are living in a particular house, and all the people in the house, they are murmuring, grumbling against you, criticizing you. You don't fight back. You don't reply them with their negative words. You go to the Lord in prayer. Your in-laws are bringing accusation to you. Since you married our son, you have not allowed him to prosper. You are eating all the money. You are spending everything. You don't reply your in-laws. You go to the Lord in prayer like Moses did. Or the people in the place of work are saying, you are the one that spoiled the work. You are the one that didn't allow us to make enough gain in this work. And they level all accusations against you falsely. Instead of replying them, quarreling and fighting with them, do like Moses, go to the Lord in prayer. When immature and carnal men criticize us unjustly, the only thing to do is to go to God in prayer and lay the case before him and leave it with him. God always respects the prayer of such people. And so God graciously responded to Moses' prayer. He showed him what to do. In response to prayer, a miracle of mercy was performed. And God gave Israel water to drink out of the rock. You see, this is what we're to learn. That our God is a mighty, a powerful, and all-sufficient God. If others grumble, let us continue to pray. If others have any complaint, any grumbling, any kind of a gossip, let us not gossip with them. Let us continue to pray. In Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 15. Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 15. In fact, in many parts of the Bible, we have the record that God actually answered this prayer. And that he just gave them abundance of water out of the rock. In this verse 15, he said, Who led thee through the great and terrible wilderness, wherein were fairy serpents and scorpions and drought, where there was no water, who brought thee forth water out of the rock of flint? Psalm 78 verse 15. Psalm 78 verse 15. He clave the rocks in the wilderness and gave them drink out of the great depths. He brought streams also out of the rock and caused waters to run down like rivers. You can see that God actually answered the prayer in a mighty way. Psalm 105 verse 41. He opened the rock and the waters gushed out. They ran in the dry places like a river. All these are testimonies of the fact that the water actually came out of the rock. Psalm 114, verses 7 and 8. Tremble thou earth at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the God of Jacob, which turned the rock 
into a standing water, the flint into fountain of waters. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 4, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 4, And did all drink of the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. So you will see the miracle that God performed. You see, God can open fountains uh, for supply where we least expect. Those who keep to God's way can trust him to provide them, to provide for them in the wilderness. In this passage that I've read to you now, it says the rock that followed them was Christ. It is telling us that that rock typified or symbolized Jesus Christ, the rock of our salvation. Moses smote the rock before the water gushed out for the children of Israel. Do you know that Jesus Christ, the rock of our salvation, had been smitten by the rod of the judgment of God? Because, you see, it was that rod of judgment that made him to die for us on the cross of Calvary. He was bruised for our transgression. He was smitten because of our offense. The judgment that should have come upon us came upon him. And since he had been smitten like that, the water of life through him has now flowed out for every one of us. And so whosoever will can now come to this rock, the rock of ages, and he can come to drink. Christ the rock had to be smitten before grace could flow forth, reaching out to all mankind. Why is Jesus Christ referred to as rock? Because the rock symbolizes something that has strength and stability and durability and elevation. And so because of that, Jesus Christ is likened to the rock. Let me show you some references of scripture. In 2 Samuel chapter 22, look at verses 2 and 3. And he said, the Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. You see, it says, the Lord is my rock. Just like it says, the Lord is my shepherd. Also, the Lord is my rock. In verse 3, the God of my rock. In him will I trust. He is my shield and the horn of my salvation, my high tower and my refuge, my savior. Thou savest me from violence. You can see that uh, our salvation has come from Christ and it says the rock of my salvation. That means that Jesus is likened to the rock. In Romans chapter 9 verse 33, As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone, and rock of offense, whosoever believeth on him, referring to that rock, whosoever believeth in him shall not be ashamed. In First Peter chapter 2, verses 7 and 8, Unto you therefore which believe is he precious, but unto them which be disobedient the stone, which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner, and a stone of stumbling. And a rock, you see that, a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. That's why if you look at Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, it says, And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The rock is not Peter, the rock is the rock of ages. That is Jesus Christ. The rock that followed them was Christ. So we have learned today that Jesus Christ, our rock, will supply all our need. We don't need to smite him anymore. He has been smitten already on the cross of Calvary. As a result of his bearing our punishment, the smiting of the judgment of God for us, now the water of life and all that we'll ever need, they are flowing out for us. We can come to Christ, to the rock of ages, and receive all our supply. Now let us go back to Exodus chapter 17. That leads us now to the third point, Israel's victory over the Amalekites. Let us look at Exodus chapter 17 from verse 8. Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. Now do you notice something here? That just after receiving the miracle of water from the rock, the Amalekites struck at the children of Israel. Satan is not happy that we have the water of life from the Lord. And immediately you receive that salvation, the water of life, you may find out that he'll bring his attack, he'll bring his temptation across your way. Immediately these children of Israel received 
the water from the rock, then the Amalekites fought against them. But I want to show you something very important in the word of God. In Deuteronomy chapter 25, verses 17 and 18. This is so important. So you must look at it. Deuteronomy chapter 25 from verse 17. Remember what Amalek did unto thee by the way when ye were come forth out of Egypt. Verse 18. How he met thee by the way and smote the innermost part of thee, even all that were feeble behind thee, when thou wast faint and weary, and he feared not God. To start with, I want you to notice in that verse 18, even all that were feeble behind thee. When the children of Israel came out of Egypt, the Bible says there was not one feeble person among all their tribes. A few months later now, we find that there were some feeble people among them. How did we have feeble people among these people? Murmuring, anxiety, and unbelief, and grumbling have weakened them. You know, sometimes on a day of miracle, on a day of crusade, on a day of the manifestation of the power of God, everyone is strong. God has healed many people, delivered many people. The joy of the Lord is flowing. And the Bible says, the joy of the Lord shall be thy strength. And there will be no feeble person. Even the old one is running back home and the young ones are running, the women are running, the pregnant ones are very strong. After some few months, then we begin to say, so and so is weak, so and so is feeble. So and so is down, so and so cannot rise up from the bed. We say, What? What happened? Well, you see, these people here, murmuring, grumbling, unbelief, prayerlessness, lukewarmness, weaken them. I want you to notice another thing in this verse 18. How he met thee by the way and smote the in inmost part of thee. You see, the children of Israel were going like a mighty great crowd. But these people once were saying, I cannot run. I cannot follow them. If they want to run, let them run. Uh, they are too fast for me. Every time doctrine, every time teaching, every time uh, rise up now. I'm not ready now. Those people that were behind, that were grumbling at the back, that could not move fast, together with the people, when Amalek struck, they were the people he struck first. Normally when Amalekites strike, the people that are behind, eh, I cannot pray, I cannot fast, eh, prayer is too much, I cannot read Bible. Every time they say when you wake up in the morning, read the Bible. I cannot sing and I cannot work for God. I cannot do evangelism. Um, I will be coming to church when I, when I have strength. Those people at the back that are following, they are not totally in the world, they are not totally in the church, and they are at the back dragging their feet very, very slow. Far at the back, they are the people Amalekites strike first. And so Amalek rose up against the children of Israel. Who were these Amalekites, by the way? You know that Amalek was one of the children, one of the descendants of Esau. These children of Israel were the descendants of Jacob. Amalekites were descendants of Esau. Do you know that Esau and Jacob were twin brothers? Oh, this is the fulfillment of what Jesus Christ said when he said, Even the people of your own household will be your foe, will be your spiritual enemies. A man's foes shall be they of his own household. And so you see, Amalekites struck these people. So what did Moses instruct to be done? In verse 9 of Exodus chapter 17, And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out men and go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses had said unto him, and fought with Amalek. And Moses and Aaron and all went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass, when Moses held up his hand, that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy, and they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat thereon. And Aaron and all stayed up his hands, the one on the one side, the other on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. There is a lot for us to learn there. Do you know that today, many times, young Joshua who can fight on the battlefield, they neglect or they despise the old Moses who can stay on the top of the mountain just praying.
But do you know that the victory they had here depended not so much on Joshua fighting with the strength of the young man, but it depended so much on Moses lifting up the hand to God in prayer. We are told that as Joshua was fighting, along with some chosen people fighting against the Amalekites, Moses lifted up the rod. Whenever the rod was up in prayer unto God, then Joshua was overcoming the Amalekites. When his hands were heavy and he then put on the hand, the Amalekites would prevail. That shows you the importance of the place of a leader. Joshua, no matter how strong you are, no matter how intelligent you are, no matter how forceful you are, how skilled you are, you need the leadership, you need the prayer of the leader that God has appointed over you. And then Aaron and O, they came to the help of Moses. They didn't say if your hand is heavy, bring the rod and then take the rod from Moses and then lift it up. No, it, even though it is that same rod, it will not be as effective as when it's in the hand of Moses. Because God had appointed Moses for the people. And so they supported him. They put a stone under him to sit down. He had been standing up before. Now they lifted up his hands. And his hand lifted up the rod. The prayer became consistent. And it was mighty and powerful. And so Joshua overcame. Do you know that Jesus Christ is now seated by the right hand of the Father? As a result of his intercession for us. The lifting up of his hand on our behalf. That's why we're having the victory down here. Joshua was fighting in the valley. Moses was praying on the mountain top. And so Joshua in the valley had all the victory that he needed to have. Our Lord is making intercession for us. He is seated up on high. As we fight the battle in the valley here, we can trust the Lord that his prayer will never fail. And that by the grace of God, we will overcome in Jesus' name. After the battle, an altar was built unto the Lord, in verse 15. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it Jehovah Nissi. Jehovah Nissi means the Lord is my banner. The altar was raised to the glory of God, not to the praise or the honor of Joshua. Whenever we give testimony, after we have got victory, the honor must not go to the prayer warrior. The honor must not go to Joshua. The honor must not go to any man. The glory must go to Jehovah Nisi, must go to the Lord our banner. We have learned a lot today, and we can go to the Lord in prayer. If we're still carnal, we need to go and plead with God that he will circumcise our hearts so that all the murmuring, all the complaining, all the unbelief, all the prayerlessness, all the criticism, everything will go out of our lives. If there is any need in our life, let us look to the rock that begat us. Let us look at Jesus Christ. And the water of supply will still come out of the rock for you and for me. If you have been dragging your feet behind the crowd, behind the congregation, remember that when the Amalekites strike, they will strike at the people of little faith, of weak faith, of lukewarmness, the people that are not in and out, the people that are not at the center of the congregation. They will strike from behind. Let us uh, fight manfully against temptation, against sin, against the devil, Christ is on the throne praying for us. We shall overcome. Do not be weak in prayer. Talk to the Lord before you go. Let the might of the Lord support you. And you will overcome all your troubles and all your problems as you talk to the Lord in prayer.